Good morning. Welcome to the online ministry of Pitcoke United Methodist Church. Pitco UMC is located on FM 116, about halfway between Gatesville and Coppers Cove. We have our on-site, in-person worship services at 10 a.m. every Sunday morning. We're a small congregation with a small sanctuary, but we try to practice all the, the proper procedures so that we minimize the impact or the, the possibility of, of exposing anyone uh, to the coronavirus. So if you'd like to be in a small, intimate worship service, join us at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning at Pidco United Methodist Church. Now, before we begin our time together this morning, let's have a short word of prayer. Father, we're amazed at all that you've done for us and do for us. We're amazed at your grace. We're amazed at the love that you've given us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're amazed at him. So, Father, as we look to your word this morning, may we be amazed at Jesus. May we be amazed by his authority of word. May we be amazed by his power. And Father, may we share that amazement with the world around us. In his name we pray. Amen. As human beings, we're an idolatrous, hero-worshiping race. We, look, we like to look at people that in positions of authority or prestige, whether they're celebrities or political leaders or religious leaders, and treat them as if somehow or the other they had uh, some vastly superior spirituality or intellect or ability, something far beyond we mere mortals. And yet, when we get up close to them, when we see them up close and personal, or when we're exposed to them long enough and dig deep enough, as an old friend of mine used to say, if you scratch any dog long enough, you'll find fleas. The idea is, what I'm trying to convey here, is that these are people just like you and I are, subject to the same foibles, the same faults, the same failings that you and I are. We can't elevate them to a pedestal and keep them there as if they were some kind of sort of demigods. We have to realize that they're mortal, just like we are. We've come in our age to the point where it's hard for us to trust anyone in positions of authority or in positions of, of celebrity, as it were, because we've been let down betrayed so many times. It even becomes difficult for us sometimes to, to look to Jesus and really trust Him, really believe who He is, really believe that He is who He is. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior come to take away the Lamb of God, come to take away the sin of the world. Surely there are those who say that the Bible is just a collection of religious platitudes with inaccurate histories and, and unreliable accounts in it. But I'd remind you that the Bible is not a, a textbook on history or science. Archaeologically and historically, the Bible has been proven again and again to be at least as reliable and at least as, as trustworthy as the, com, as the contemporary historical accounts. Many times proven more so. And yet, what do we see when we look to the Bible and look to Jesus? Again, the critics would tell us that Jesus was just a, a teacher of, of religious, uh, religious and moral truths and that he was, he was only elevated to the status of the divine years later after his death by his disciples who wanted somehow to, to gain status in their world. And yet, as we look to the Word, as we look to the Bible, we find more we find a different picture of this one named Jesus. Let me read for you this morning from Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 21. That's Mark chapter 1, verse 21, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and they were astonished at his teaching. <clears throat> for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes, and immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing the man and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. 
and it wants his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Mark's Gospel begins with these kinds of short and, and as it were, pithy type stories. Stories that are somewhat short on detail and yet present for us a picture of Jesus and Jesus' early ministry that not so much about what he taught as what he did. The kinds of things that uh, that Jesus did early in his ministry were pretty much unremarkable outside of his baptism where he received the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the approval of God the Father. But the events that we read about here in Capernaum are about to change all that. Mark doesn't tell us what Jesus thought. He doesn't tell us what he thought, what he taught. He doesn't. He only comments here that the people were amazed. That's the word that you read in the New International Version and some others where it says they were astonished at his teaching. They kind of mean, they kind of come the same way. They mean to have, have shades of the same meaning. And yet, we see they were astonished and amazed because he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. The language indicates that he spoke as one speaking for himself and not as the representative of another. The scribes of the day were learned men. They had studied the scriptures, they had years of schooling to their credit, and they understood the Mosaic law and its interpretation. They had the keys, as it were, to those, pa those passages of scripture, the Old Testament, which was, all, was available to them at the time. And yet, we find that they didn't understand so much. But they would have to, as they taught, they would have to refer to other authorities I do the same thing in my preaching. You'll often hear me hear me quote commentators that I respect, or quote those uh, the writings of some, uh, even sometimes people who are not Christian, to make a point. It's, way, it's our way of saying, my way of saying, don't take my word for it. Hear what this learned person, this authority, has to say about it. I suspect the scribes of Jesus' day were a lot the same. They would quote the teachers. They would quote the rabbis. They would quote Moses. They would quote others to say, here, listen to what they say. In the 16th century, most of the theological teachers never referred to the Bible. They preferred instead to refer to the writings and the teachings of Aristotle and other, uh, and other commentators and philosophers. Little was taught from Scripture, and not a little was taught from the, pro from the popular authors of the day. Very similar, uh, very similar to what we are today. And yet there was a young Augustinian monk named Martin Luther. Luther was something of an anomaly. He didn't focus on Aristotle. In fact, Luther despised Aristotle because he believed that Aristotle steered people and pushed people away from God rather than drawing them in to show them, show them God and show them their relationship to God. Luther, intended, Luther tended to stress or to focus upon the writings of some who'd gone before him, who were translators of the Bible and those who taught the Bible and it's in, in, as, they, as pure, near as they could to its purest form, they taught scripture and not philosophy. For an, an example of that would be John Huss, who was uh, many years the predecessor of Luther and was burned at the stake for his trouble. I keep losing my place in my Bible here. <laughs> but... As Luther taught, as he studied, he ran across a verse in the first chapter of Romans, Romans 1.17, where the scripture says, the just shall live by faith, or the righteous shall live by faith. Legend has it that when Luther discovered that and he began to understand what it was saying, that he wrote with his pen in the margin of his Latin Bible, sola, the Latin word which means only. He was saying, we will live by faith only. Luther and others began to understand that God had more for them than was being offered to them by the contemporary theolog theological teachings that was being offered to them by the, by the church. And they began to teach and they began to preach. And though that, group of, that group of young zealot theologians, if you will, brought with a catalyst for the bonfire that would become the Protestant Reformation. But even Martin Luther great a man as he was and as great as his influence was on the modern church, we're still, we still feel the repercussions of Luther's teachers today, teaching today. Even Luther was only a representation of the truth and not the truth itself. Jesus didn't need to repeat 
what others had said, even though he did refer to the Old Testament prophets and to Moses. But he didn't quote other authorities. He didn't need to quote other authorities to make his point, to, to stand to so, show what the truth was, because Jesus is the truth. He is the authority. As a preacher, I'm a student of words, and that's because I believe that words have the power to persuade and to instruct, and persuasion and instruction have the power to change lives. And yet, I can't pretend to be a teacher like Jesus. I can't pretend to know or have the authority that he had. People were astonished at the authority with which Jesus taught because he didn't teach like the scribes. I would, I would, I would dread having to stand and preach after Jesus had preached because I could not begin to even, even begin to have the authority that he has. But they were amazed at that authority. They were amazed at the authority of his word. But then Mark tells us no sooner had he finished his teaching, while people were still marveling at the authority with which he was teaching, that a man with an evil spirit cried out. Now this wasn't just an exclamation. It wasn't just noise in the congregation. <laughs> I've had young mothers tell me that they won't come to church with their babies because they're afraid they'll disrupt the services. And I've told every one of them, when I get to the point where I can't preach over a crying infant, I might as well quit. I grew up in a, in a, in a tradition where, there was, where shouting was, was not only encouraged, it was expected. A raucous amen or a hearty preach it brother stirs me up even to this day. Now we United Methodists are a quiet bunch in our worship. And I think maybe part of that quietness is we're afraid that we don't we don't want to egg the preacher on too much. They don't. But most people, and I've had people tell me this: you don't need any more encouragement. You do enough on your own. And if we get, if you go too far, we'll be late for lunch. <laughs> but this man cried out, and this wasn't just an overzealous person in the congregation. This was a cry of anguish and fear. What are you doing here, Jesus? Have you come to destroy us, he said? I know who you are. Most language scholars believe that as the man cried out, he was speaking for more than one spirit, not just a spirit, but multiple spirits who possessed him. He's saying to Jesus here, the words that are used of Jesus here are only used three times in the New Testament, and each time they're used, they indicate a recognition of the divine origin of Jesus of Nazareth, rather than acknowledgement of his being the Messiah. In other words, the possessed man was crying out, I know who you are. You are God come to walk among us, and you have the power to destroy us. Notice that Jesus didn't counsel with the man. He didn't try to comfort him or reason with him. Instead, he spoke directly to the spirits and commanded them to be silent and come out of the man. Now, if I did that, not a few of my congregation would be on their phone to the district superintendent as soon as they got to their cars to tell him, we don't know what kind of preacher you've sent us, but he's some kind of a nut. I couldn't do that. I don't have that authority. And these people had never seen anyone with that authority either. They were amazed. And that amazement is different than our amazement at his teaching, than their amazement at his teaching, rather. They were awe-stricken at his teaching, but they were frightened and dumbstruck by his command of the unclean spirits. Imagine the scene. A teacher has just told you things which, at which you're astonished. Now, a man who was deranged and disturbed, crying out in the, in the service, and Jesus saying to him, be quiet, come out of him, and him being delivered from the unclean spirits, that's pretty amazing. You know, we like to hear about things that are fantastic. It's like we want to see things that are too astonishing to believe. That Maybe that's the reason why magicians and sleight of hand artists are so popular. It's like we're saying, show me something that strains my ability to believe. There are those, I'm sure, who saw Jesus as little more than a sideshow magician. There's no doubt that some saw him as a potential strong man, perhaps one who has come to rid the Jews of their conquerors. That was the Messiah that they were looking for. But the words and the actions of Jesus in the synagogue in Capernaum proved him to be more than that. 
Perhaps once in a generation, a leader emerges who captures the imagination of the people and is able to bring about great change. In some generations, there may be more than one as conditions create the need, the requirement, the necessity of great leaders. We can think about Lincoln or Grant or Lee and the horror that was the Civil War. We can look to a later example and see men like Roosevelt and MacArthur and Nimitz and Eisenhower and others. There were many great leaders in the era of World War II and that greatest generation. We can come a little more to our time and see men like Kennedy and King and, and uh, Gandhi and others. More recently, we might think of someone like Margaret Thatcher or Indira Gandhi in India or St. Teresa of Kolkata. We can think of them and we see that none of these, as great as they were, ever elicited the amazement that followed a close-up exposure to Jesus. Not one of them manifested the purity of thought and heart that marked the character and teaching of Jesus. None of them could command the spirits or the winds. None of them could take the blood of a perfect sacrifice for sin into the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made man-made, man as the writer of the Hebrews letter tells us in Hebrews 9.11. We can, like the people in the synagogue in Nazareth, be amazed at Jesus' teaching and power and still not recognize and follow him for who he is. That amazement must give way to acceptance and surrender if we're to know him and follow him as our Lord. The late Dr. J. Vernon McGee was one of my favorite preachers early on in my Christian experience. And even today, even though he's been dead for many years, his Through the Bible radio program is still carried on a lot of Christian broadcasting stations. And whenever I run across it on my radio dial, I'll stop and listen. Even though sometimes I'm hearing, I'm hearing teaching sessions and sermons that Dr. McGee preached many, many years ago and that I've heard more than once. But my favorite story from Dr. McGee comes from some of his writings that I read many years ago. As a seminary student, Dr. McGee pastored a small church in the hills of Georgia. And as most preachers would want to do at the end of each service, he would stand and, and uh, shake the congregation out, as some, we sometimes say, greet everyone as they left the church. On this one particular Sunday, a young boy wearing overalls and brogans hung back from the back of the crowd and waited until everyone else was gone to approach his pastor. And Dr. McGee asked him, so what can I do for you, son? And the little boy, who wouldn't even look at Dr. McGee, he stood with his head down and his eyes averted, and he said, I listened to your sermon. I never knew Jesus could be so wonderful. Dr. McGee said that was the highest compliment that anyone had ever paid him as a preacher. Shouldn't that be our aim? To help people see just how wonderful Jesus is? To be amazed at him and then to share that amazement with others. The last verse of that passage we read a little while ago said, And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Perhaps one of the reasons why we see such deterioration in our churches today, why we're continually having to, to turn to more and more entertainment in our churches, as opposed, to, as opposed to simply preaching the Word of God, as opposed to simply helping people be amazed at Jesus, Perhaps that's the reason. Perhaps because we want people, we're, we're not amazed, so we can't help anyone else to be amazed. Shouldn't it be our aim to let folks know just how wonderful this Jesus is? Shouldn't it be our aim to tell the story of our Savior? Shouldn't people be amazed by our Jesus? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Thank you for being with us this morning. And may God bless you.